Are we ready? All right. Why don't we get going? Yeah. Good evening, everybody. Hello, hello. Um, I'm Dr. Stephen Hausman. Um, I'm an assistant professor in the history department at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota, where I teach classes on, yep, in St. Paul, Minnesota, you know what's up, where I teach classes on, oh, come on, I just started, you haven't missed much. Um, I teach classes on US history since kind of the Civil War, so since the mid 19th century. I teach classes on environmental history and environmental justice. I teach classes on native history, and um, I, when I can, I teach classes that combine all of those things. So that's a little bit about my background. I'm also working on a larger book project about uh, sort of the environmental history of the Black Hills and specifically about activism and about the 1972 Rapid City Flood, which I'm gonna be talking more about in a little bit. So, and I say that part because this is an ongoing project. You know, I don't know everything about this particular event, let alone about the Black Hills. So I'm really hoping that after I'm done with my whole spiel here in a little bit, that some of you will have questions, because questions always push me to find out new stuff that I don't already know. So think about questions while I am talking. And if you know something that I did not say, please do bring it up, because again, this is an ongoing project and I'm still learning stuff myself. So. Um, I want to thank you all for coming out tonight, and I especially want to thank you all for inviting me to the Talking uh, Circle series here at the Crazy Horse Memorial. You know, just looking at the slate of speakers that I've been included as, as a part of, you know, I feel very humbled and honored to be a part of this. So thank you all for having me. Thanks to Andrew and thanks to Travis in particular for inviting me. And thanks once more to all of you all for coming out to hear me talk tonight. So I'm going to speak tonight about the indigenous history of Rapid City, South Dakota, and specifically about the 1972 Rapid City flood. Raise your hand if before seeing my nice PowerPoint right there, you had heard of the 1972 Rapid City flood. Who's heard of that event before? Raise your hands high so I can see them. Most of you, thank you very much, most of you have not. Okay, that's good to know. Um, so specifically, I'm gonna be talking about the role that that flood played in the more recent hi native history of Rapid City. As some of you, but perhaps not all of you know, that flood had its 50th anniversary memorialization event in Rapid City just a couple weeks ago. I also spoke at that event, and the very sad memories of that disaster are on a lot of people's mind right now, as really the whole region, most of West River, South Dakota, reflects on why this disaster occurred, on the lives that were lost in this disaster, and on the meaning that we can draw from the history of the flood itself. And it's really on this last point that I'll be using as the, my theme for my talk tonight, because history, to me, is fundamentally about meaning. It's about meaning. It's about what meanings we can draw from the past. And so the 1972 Rapid City Flood was, of course, a tragedy. It was a disaster. It was, it was a horrible, sad moment in that city's history. But as a historian, I also believe that every tragedy also presents an opportunity, an opportunity for those in the present, for us in this room right now, to learn from and to build from. I think that this is the power of History. This is the use of history, that even in the darkest moments of the human past are offered paths into a better future if we are willing to look for them, if we are willing to listen to them. This idea of finding meaning in the history of a tragedy is going to be kind of the theme running through my talk tonight, as I talk a bit about the history of the flood and how it's intertwined with the native history of Rapid City. So I'm going to speak for about 40-ish minutes or so, and that'll leave us about 20 minutes or so for questions and comments. Unless you all have a lot of questions and comments, then we can go all night, as far as I'm concerned, as long as you all are willing to stick around and talk with me. Okay, so... A few of you, but not many of you, are familiar with that change? It changed, good. Are, might already know the story of the 1972 flood, but I'll go over the basics for those of you that are not aware of this event. On the evening of June 9th, 1972, so again, just over 50 years ago, a massive storm parked itself over the eastern and northern portions of the Black 
hills, causing torrential rain, which swelled dozens of creeks and streams all throughout this region, including Rapid Creek. As the rain fell with increasing intensity on the night of June 9th, 1972, the spillways, which let water through, um, the, the spillways of Canyon Lake Dam, spillways are the places where water can flow through the dam, those spillways, they're supposed to relieve pressure, they clogged so that the water could not come through them, so more and more pressure built up against the wall of Canyon Lake Dam, which sits just outside of Rapid City, and that dam burst just before midnight on June 9th, 1972. Millions of gallons of water rushed down Rapid Creek, which, in case you don't know, runs right through the middle of downtown Rapid City, throughout downtown Rapid City. It was the dam's collapse which turned the flood from disaster into cataclysm, and which really caused the brunt of the flood's uh, 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 property destruction and loss of life that night. At least, at a minimum, 238, 238 people died that night. Over 1,500 homes were destroyed, and at least $100 million in damage was wrought that night, all told. Everybody in Rapid City suffered in the flood that night, and nobody in Rapid City emerged from the night of June 9th, 1972 unaffected, whether they lost a family member, whether they lost a home, whether they lost a friend, whether they lost a neighbor. But the flood also did not mete out its destruction equally. The flood devastated a huge swath of Rapid City, including large portions of downtown Rapid City as well. But the places that were hit particularly hard were trailer parks and were lower income neighborhoods that were really located right within the floods, or excuse me, the creek's floodplain. Additionally, while exact numbers are difficult to come by, one government source estimated that perhaps 33 of the confirmed 238 people who died were native people living in Rapid City. That's approximately 13% of the death toll. The true figure is impossible to know. Death counts like this are works of basically educated guesswork, right? We don't know for sure. So these are estimated numbers. I personally believe that both of these numbers are likely higher. A lot of Native people from reservations in the area lived in Rapid City only seasonally. Right? So they would come into town for a time, then they would go back home for a time as well, making the demographic size of the Native community in Rapid in the 1970s kind of difficult to pin down. Some of them lived in transient dwellings along the creek itself, making them equally difficult to include in data. Displacement numbers, people who lost their homes, are also equally difficult to estimate. One report from like a year after the flood claimed that 18%, and I'm quoting from the report here, claimed that 18% of those displaced were minority families, which is three times the percentage of non-white people who lived in Rapid City as of the 1970 census. The number of Native people killed by the floodwaters, I think, can be fairly estimated at 35 to 40 people, which on the low end of that estimate is 15% of the total death toll, and at the high end of that estimate is nearly 20% of the total flood victims. This number, 15 to 20%, is significantly higher than the Native population in Rapid City as of 1970, which according to that year's census was around 2,000 people out of a total city population of around 44,000 people. So that's a little under 5% of the city's overall population. So compare those numbers, right? 5% of the city's population and as many as 20% of those who died in the flood. This is inequality, right? We call this environmental injustice. That's what this is an example of. And those numbers aren't even counting displacement or property destruction or injury. Again. What I'm talking about here is a textbook example of environmental injustice, when the harmful effects of human decisions about the non-human world, about the environment, disproportionately impact one group of people over another. Historians, people like me, our favorite question, maybe our favorite word, is why? Why do things happen the way they happen. I believe that examples of environmental injustice such as this, that they demand an explanation. They demand an answer to that question of why. So 
That's what I'm going to try to do a bit tonight as well, is get at that question of why. And in explaining, in finding an answer to that question of why, we need to talk about the history of Rapid City as a native place. So let's start at the beginning. The place where we are all sitting was native space, was indigenous space well before it became part of the United States. It remains native space, native land today. Prior to American arrival and illegal dispossession of the Black Hills toward the end of the 19th century, the Lakota, the Cheyenne, the Arapaho, the Kiowa, all called the Black Hills home, among many, many others who have done so since time immemorial. People have lived along the banks of Rapid Creek for just as long. Called Mani Luzahan in Lakota, named after its very fast running waters, the waterway runs for about 100 miles from its headwaters within the Black Hills down to the Cheyenne River out east on the plains. And it's for a very long time been an important site of resource gathering, of trade and meeting, and of spiritual renewal. In the mid-19th century, I'm going to go over a lot of history kind of fast here, so bear with me. But in the mid-19th century, the United States began encroaching on Lakota and Cheyenne territory near the Black Hills on the Northern Plains, sparking a whole series of conflicts and of treaties, which culminated in Red Cloud's War and the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1868. This war was a native victory, which for a time marked American retreat from the Black Hills region in the Northern Plains. This changes, however, in 1874, in the midst of the worst economic depression in American history. The Grant administration orders a ostensibly, like supposedly scientific expedition into the Black Hills. I can't help but wonder why a scientific expedition needs like cannon to come with, but that's outside the, the, the sort of bounds of my talk here. The Grant administration orders a, a scientific, supposedly, expedition led by George Custer into the Black Hills. The Black Black Hills had long been a place that was rumored to have gold. The expedition indeed finds gold deposits, announces as much publicly they had hoped to find gold. They actually took newspaper reporters from Chicago and New York City with them into the Black Hills so if they found gold, they could immediately send reports back saying gold in the Black Hills, and that's exactly what happens. This sparks a gold rush of gold seekers and settlers and a strong native defense of their lands. And despite early victories by a native alliance of several tribes and nations, most famously at the Greasy Grass or the Little Bighorn in June of 1876, the United States uh, 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 ends up taking advantage of dwindling bison herds and are able to defeat and scatter the Lakota and their allies, imposing a very punitive and fraudulent illegal treaty on them and putting the Black Hills under American control. Again, I said I was going to do a lot of history very fast, but this is kind of the, the larger background to this story. It's during this era of conflict, in the winter of 1876, that a group of white settlers founded Rapid City along Rapid Creek. And indeed, not long after its founding, Lakotas attack this new settlement, attempting to eject this American presence from Miniluzahan and maintain native sovereignty over this region. And even after the US government seizes the hills in 1877, native people still maintained Rapid City as part of their geography. Despite American efforts to keep them out of this place that had always been theirs, they maintain it as part of their geography. A couple examples. From the 1880s onwards, Rapid City holds what they call annual Stuckman's Days festivities in Rapid City, which always involved native people. If you look at pictures of Stockman's Days festivals from the late 19th and early 20th century, you always see Lakotas and other native people of all ages standing on the sidewalks, taking in the festivities, just like their white neighbors. Others take part in the events themselves. They are competing in rodeos and in horse races or participating, like in this picture here, in parades through downtown Rapid City. Lakotas from Pine Ridge and other nearby reservations also continue to visit sacred sites throughout the Black Hills throughout this period, including hot springs and wind caves. So despite dispossession of their homelands in the 1870s, Native people maintain an active presence throughout Rapid City and the Black Hills in defiance of what the United States was trying to do, basically keeping them out of this area. For much of the late 19th and early 20th century, the Rapid City Indian School also serves as an additional hub, an additional location of Rapid City's urban native geography. The school was founded in 1898 as an assimilationist institution. Um, the Rapid City School ensured that native students would be present in Rapid City as students, but also as 
runaways, often as people who were running away, who were fleeing from this institution. And students who ran away from the Rapid City Indian School were able to use the existing native community in and around Rapid City to, as a means of avoiding school officials, basically being able to hide, to get away from the school for a time and live with kin, live with friends, live with family in and around Rapid City. One such student was Levi Black Bear. He ran away in 1916. The school sends out administrators trying to find him, and they say, quote, that they made inquiry at the camps all around Rapid City, but they couldn't find him for several days because he was living with family out there, and they were hiding him, so he didn't have to go back to this school. The following year, 1917, a girl named Margaret Tutu also ran away, and she hid for a time, and I'm quoting here from the records of the Rapid City Indian School. They're kept in the National Archives location in Kansas City. And in those documents, they say that she, quote, hid for a time in camp about three miles north of Rapid City before officials were able to track her down and return her to the school. Albert Yankton, another young student who was able to, again quoting these documents, live around the camps for a week before leaving to go back home to the Pine Ridge Reservation. He had arrived in town planning on attending the school, but decided he didn't want to and used the people that he knew in the Rapid City Native community to stay away from the school for a time. So for young Albert Yankton and other students escaping from the Rapid City School, the Native community residing in Rapid City served as an alternative to assimilationist education. And try as they might, school officials couldn't control students who were homesick and who were desperate to see friends and family. The ability for students running away from the Rapid City Indian School to find refuge in and around Rapid City, it's a testament to the presence, to the size, to the tightly knit nature of the Native community in the city in the early 20th century. However, whites in Rapid City created an often unwelcome atmosphere for Rapid City's native community. Cecilia Hernandez Montgomery was an Ogallala Lakota woman uh, born in 1910 on Pine Ridge, and she lived all around the Black Hills region, all around the Northern Plains, really, uh, 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 during the first half of the 20th century, including in Rapid City. She remembered many years later, quote, that they had signs in businesses saying no Indians allowed. She remembered another time when she went looking for a house, she said, and when I showed up, they found out I was an Indian. And they said, sorry, it's been rented out. The journalist, Tim Gallego, also lived in Rapid City for a long time. And he similarly remembered once, in his words, applying for a job at a local bakery uh, when he was a teenager. He said the owner looked at the application and then looked at me. And he said, I don't hire anyone from the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. And he dismissed me with that comment. So by doing things like disallowing the use of public facilities, like restaurants, by denying them the right to rent or own property where they wanted to do so, by enforcing employment discrimination, many white Rapid Cityans did their best to deny Native people the kind of upward economic mobility that really defined mid-20th century America in the 1950s and 1960s, in the kind of post-World War II era, forcing many Native people to live in segregated sections around Rapid City throughout the first half of the 20th century. The most well-known of these was a place called Oshkosh Camp, pictured, oops, sorry, pictured not there, but I meant to go to the slide earlier, so I'll leave it up for a second. Pictured here, there we go. By the late 1920s, the Indian neighborhood along Rapid Creek had become firmly established as part of the city's geography. It was during that decade that a lot of Native people began living near the Warren Land Lumber Company, which was one of the only large institutions in Rapid City that would employ Native people. This huge lumber yard and sawmill, which was on Omaha Street. And Warren Lamb rented out land to its workers near Oshkosh Street. That's where the name comes from, Oshkosh Street, Oshkosh Camp. And soon the neighborhood bore that name, Oshkosh Camp. Cecilia Montgomery, who I quoted earlier, she lived in Oshkosh Camp for a while, and she remembered it this way. She said, outdoor toilets were the rule in Oshkosh, and there was only one single place for everyone in this neighborhood to get water. There was no running water. There were few, if any, city services in Oshkosh Camp. And Oshkosh soon became one of the major native neighborhoods in 
rapid city. By the 1930s, so skipping ahead a little bit now, in the 1930s, Oshkosh Camp was a neighborhood of, uh, in the words of one person who lived there, tar paper shacks and clapboard cabins. So not very sturdy, firm houses along Rapid Creek. We're talking right along the banks of Rapid Creek here. Despite these conditions, however, Oshkosh was a community. It was a place where people lived, where people built a community. One could travel the length, remembered one person. One could travel the length of Rapid Creek and find Indians, Mexicans, and the poor white families of Rapid City all living side by side. One person who lived there was someone named Pedro Pete Pascual Torres, who came to Rapid City from Mexico in 1930. And he ended up staying in the native neighborhoods along Rapid Creek. And he remembered it this way. He said the Indian people were the first and really the only ones to open their homes to us and to feed us when we got to Rapid City. So to some people in Rapid City, Oshkosh was simply a slum, right? But to the people that lived there, it was a community. It was a neighborhood. Throughout the mid 20th century, however, white Rapid Cityans increasingly saw Oshkosh not as a community, not as a neighborhood, but as a dangerous zone of violence, of a lack of cleanliness, of ill health. With this native neighborhood, and I'll go back to this map right here just to have a sense of where we're talking about here. With this native neighborhood um, located so close to downtown Rapid, a lot of whites in Rapid City saw this place as a nuisance, even as dangerous, as a blight on the city. Beginning in the 1930s, the Rapid City Journal, stay here for now, the Rapid City Journal, the newspaper in Rapid City, regularly reported on violence and crime in Oshkosh with headlines and articles saying things like, there was a shooting at the Indian camp in Rapid City, and it is under investigation, reported one story in 1936. When two Native people left the Sioux Sanatorium, which had been the Rapid City Indian School, which closed in 33 and instead becomes a hospital, they engaged in a fistfight in Oshkosh. A local judge reported in the newspaper deemed, quote, the problem of patients from the Sioux Sanatorium mingling with citizens a definite menace to the community. And I want to kind of pause on that quote for a minute, because the judge, in speaking there, is doing something interesting. He's saying when the, uh, 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 when the patients from the Sioux Sanatorium mingle with citizens. So he's making a separation here, right? He's saying that Native people who are patients at the Sioux Sanatorium are not citizens, right? They don't belong in this place in short. That's kind of the implication that I see in that quote. And he calls them a definite menace to the community. Again, setting them outside of the community. A 1947 Rapid City Journal article dec decried spoke out against a rubbish fire that had been burning in the Indian camp on Omaha Street. Later that year, the city commissioner, a guy named I.H. Chase, vowed to improve sanitation in the area near Oshkosh Street in, quote, which scores of Indians dwell. One solution, the Rapid City Journal reported not long after, was for a 40-acre campground for Indians, which could be used by migratory workers and help overcome the present unsanitary conditions at the Rapid Creek Indian Camp. In short, according to this article, simply replacing one segregated neighborhood, underserved neighborhood, with another. Another article from the early 1950s calls Oshkosh simply a health menace. So Oshkosh, this place, this community, was a creation of segregation and unequal hiring and housing practices in Rapid City. For a lot of whites in Rapid City, such an undesirable blotch on the city's image simply needed removing. And it's around this time, in the 1950s, that Rapid City officials really make a concerted effort to do just that. And they at least partially succeed. In the mid-1950s, the city comes in, they evict people, and they start to bulldoze homes, in the process displacing many Native people who had lived in Oshkosh to other neighborhoods. A lot of them moved north to a federally funded housing project located just beyond the city limits. And it was placed just beyond the city limits specifically. That way, the city didn't have to pay for running water or for trash services, right? Rapid City didn't want to do a lot of funding for this newly developed housing project on the north side of the city. This was a place, pictured here, called the Sioux Addition. Yet housing in the Sioux Edition was a combination of both being very poor quality and in high 
demand, meaning that Native people could not, uh, many Native people in Rapid City could not get housing at the Sioux Edition at all. As a result of this, many instead move into trailer homes scattered throughout the city, including many in Rapid Creek's floodplain. I also believe, and this is just my research, I believe that many also continued to live along Rapid Creek. After the mid-1950s, it's kind of hard to find evidence of Oshkosh Camp, at least in the written city record, especially in the Rapid City Journal. The references to it start to get sketchier and sketchier after you get out of the 1950s. The existence of this kind of historical place called Oshkosh Camp becomes cloudy after the 1950s. There is, however, evidence that Creekside neighborhoods continued to exist in Rapid City, continued to be these kind of major hubs of native life in Rapid City. Police, for instance, still made arrests in the Oshkosh Camp as reported in the, city, in the Rapid City Journal, for instance, at least as late as 1959 and 1960, several years after its supposed removal. Oral testimony also maintains that a lot of Native people continued to live along Rapid Creek even after the destruction of the kind of centralized region of Oshkosh Camp in the mid-1950s. So I think it's more likely that rather than removing the neighborhood, Attempts by the city of Rapid at removing Oshkosh instead merely kind of scattered its residents, some north to the Sioux Edition neighborhood, and others to smaller, more dispersed camps and neighborhoods right along Rapid Creek. And I think that the fact that so many Native people perished in the 1972 flood is perhaps the clearest evidence supporting this likelihood. Regardless of the uh, neighborhood's physical extent, Oshkosh continued to linger in the minds of whites in Rapid City as an idea, as basically a code word for poverty. In the mid-1960s, a Rapid City Journal opinion columnist could write the following. He could write, everybody in Rapid City pays the same tax on his property, whether he lives on West Boulevard or in the Oshkosh camp. What he's saying here is that whether you're rich or poor, you pay the exact same amount on, you have to pay taxes on your property. Property, basically. So even if the Oshkosh neighborhood had been removed, it sticks around as an idea for people in Rapid City, right? It still comes to represent poverty. Again, not thinking about it as a neighborhood or a community, as the people who actually lived there thought of it as, but instead using it as this kind of code word for blight and for poverty. So let's kind of summarize here for a little bit before we get into the next stage of this history. By the start of the 1970s, Rapid City was a segregated place, with Native people concentrated in the north of the city in the Sioux addition, again, this neighborhood right here, and other, a couple other federal housing neighborhoods, and in places along the creek, either in more transient camps or in trailer homes. This put a lot of people in very real risk should Rapid Creek flood its banks, which is something that it does all the time. A flood in 1962, 10 years earlier, caused large amounts of destruction in Rapid City. And historical flood records say that basically you can expect Rapid Creek to have a large scale flood about once every 10 or 15 years. So while in some ways the events of 1972 were unprecedented, they were also predictable. So the night of the flood itself, June 9th, 1972, was marked by terror, it was marked by tragedy. It was also a night that was marked by bravery. And among those who saw the disaster in Rapid City firsthand was this man, Paul Woundedhead. Paul was born on the Pine Ridge Reservation in the mid-1950s, but he lived most of his life in Rapid City. And in 1972, he was a teenager. He was living with his family on Lemon Street in North Rapid. And on the stormy evening of June 9th, 1972, Paul, Okay, just making sure it's on the right slide. Paul had heard warnings that Rapid Creek might flood. It was very hard for people to find out about the flood risk that night. People in 1972, not to state the obvious, but they didn't have these, right? Those alarms that we get sometimes on our phones, those weren't going off with National Weather Service reports. If you read the records of people that lived through the flood, a lot of them only knew that there was a risk when they like literally looked out their back window and saw Rapid Creek rising like this. Paul had heard warnings, he was watching TV, and heard warnings that Rapid Creek might flood, and he had already seen the torrential downpour of rain outside his window. He said, quote, the weather report was saying it's possible we might get a flood, and just looking at Mother Nature, that's how we knew that a flood was coming. Despite the rain, despite the torrential downpour, Paul and his sister drove into downtown Rapid City at around 9 p.m. that night to get some dinner. 
they experienced firsthand the scale of the disaster that was unfolding in their city. It was really just after 9 p.m. that things started to get really bad in Rapid City. He said this, he said, we got stranded because the water was just flowing so heavily through the city. It was coming all the way up to our neck. We had to get on boats and try to get to a higher area. It was all very devastating. So Paul Woundedhead witnessed the flood's destructive power up close, and the memory stuck with him for the rest of his life. This is an image of him giving an oral history around the 40th anniversary of the flood about 10 years ago. The memories, he said, are just bad and sad. It's really hard for me to talk about it because I just remember everything. They made memories that stuck with him his entire life. And among the memories were the sounds of the night of June 9th. He said, you could just hear people screaming and hollering. It was really spooky in Rapid City that night. Elderly people were screaming and asking for help. And we tried to help them, but we couldn't do much. Paul Woundedhead's experience in Rapid City on the night of June 9th was replicated all over Rapid City as Rapid Creek's waters ran through the city's streets. To others who experienced the flood, other senses stood out. Have any of you ever considered what a flash flood smells like? I had never thought about this before starting this research. You have, but... I smelt it firsthand. You smelt it firsthand. What does it smell like? Mm -hmm. There was this heavy gas smell mm -hmm. from the creek mm -hmm. about a month or yeah. so afterwards. Yeah. Um, I mean, when the sewage washes up, when uh, and everything washes up from out of the sewers. Yeah. It was in Kansas City. Yeah. Where I grew up amongst floodplains. Yeah. Flash floods that would happen there with large rainstorms. Yeah. Storms. Um, yeah, it smells something fierce. Yeah. See, I never thought about this before. I've never experienced something like this. But going back through the memories of people that lived through it, a lot of them remember the smells of the flood itself. Bill Sen was 11 years old, and he remembered the flood smell 30 years later, saying it was not exactly a stench, just a smell of earth torn apart by floodwaters. Kim Johnson remembered what she called the smell of death permeating the air of Rapid City. Al Clark recalled how he could smell death as he approached Rapid City the next day by car. For Sheridan Quilt, it was another smell. It was the smell of mud that he could never forget. So the flood left indelible, unerasable marks on those who experienced it, memories that would last a lifetime. There are also many stories of ordinary people committing extraordinary acts in the face of this disaster. Stories like that of Rita Rosales, pictured here, who rescued her mother from drowning in the streets of Rapid City that night by literally gripping her by the hair to keep her from getting washed away. Or Second Lieutenant Gary Engelstead, pictured here. He was a National Guardsman who was only 26 years old on the night of the flood. Lieutenant Engelstead died with two of his peers trying to rescue people from a car that was being washed away in the flood. Or the dozens of people who supplied canoes and boats to aid in the search and rescue and body recovery operations. Or the three members of the Rapid City Fire Department who gave their lives in rescue operations on the night of June 9th. All of these stories of immense courage under pressure embody the best of Rapid City, and I would argue the best of humanity, the best that we as people have to offer, risking ourselves to save others. But disasters are fundamentally human events. They're human events, and thus, while they can and often do bring out the best in individuals, they also can reflect the inequalities inherent to the society in which that disaster is taking place. And the aftermath of the Rapid City Flood was also marked by the same segregation, the same racism that often defined white Native relations in Rapid City in the years before the disaster. James Emery, pictured here, who was a longtime activist and leader in Rapid City's native community. Um, he was a member of the mayor's Indian Welfare Coordination Committee in the uh, months after the flood, which was a group that was put together to make sure that uh, flood relief efforts went to the city's native community. He remembered a few such incidents in an oral history that he gave just a few weeks after the flood, when they were very fresh in his mind. Emery, for instance, described a native couple 
who drove down to Rapid City from the Rosebud Reservation who wanted to help with the recovery efforts. And they arrived late at night, about a week after the flood. There was a curfew in place in Rapid City um, where you were not supposed to be in certain parts of the city after 9 p.m. They did not know this. So when they arrive in one of these parts of the cities, they are immediately at risk and they don't even know it. In Emery's words, I'm quoting him here, he said, they got here at night and they didn't know there was a curfew. And they happened to get down into the curfew area because that was the only place they knew in Rapid City, this curfew area where all the Indian homes had been wiped out. This couple that came down to help was soon arrested. And they stayed in jail for two days for breaking curfew. Their car was towed away. Emery, pictured here, spent an entire day tracking down their car and working to get them out of jail. And this couple who had come down to help, they end up fleeing Rapid City as soon as they get out of jail. Emery also reported on Native flood victims being accused by whites in Rapid City of fraudulently claiming donated food and other relief, claiming they'd only come from nearby reservations for the free food and clothing. So these are some kind of individual examples of what I'm talking about here, but there were also these kind of larger structural problems in the relief effort as well. The federal government's Housing and Urban Development Agency, the HUD agency, stepped in to supply temporary homes to those who had, those individuals and those families whose residences had been destroyed in the flood. Most flood refugees lived in HUD trailers around Rapid City, and the government permitted them to stay in these temporary homes until they were able to find more permanent housing. Almost a year after the flood, however, many Rapid City residents were still unable to find that kind of permanent, affordable housing. As Hazel Bonner pictured here, uh, who was a representative for the United Renters Council, which was kind of like a renters advocacy group in Rapid City. As she reported uh, to Congress, who held hearings about this flood in 1973, she said, quoting her here, the people still remaining in HUD trailers are by and large lower income people in Rapid City, a year after the flood itself, who were unable to find affordable housing in Rapid. And many of these people were native people in Rapid City. Soon after the flood, a group of citizens formed another organization in Rapid City called the Indian Flood Victims, uh, excuse me, the Rapid City Indian Flood Victims Association. It's a long name for this organization, the RCIFVA. This organization, sought to ensure that relief money went to native flood victims and helped to ensure local and national relief efforts met the needs of the city's native population. RCI FVA representatives, representatives from this group I'm talking about, they also testified at these same congressional hearings that were held about the flood a year after it happened. One representative, said, quote, in general, it's been our observation as part of the RCIFVA that there has, in fact, been discrimination against Indian flood victims in the wake of the flood. That man's name was Edgar Lonehill, and his testimony in this congressional hearing is pretty shocking. He estimated, Lonehill estimated, that around 250 or 300 Indians, and I'm quoting him here, were segregated into two camps in Rapid City. He claimed, Lone Hill claimed, that the segregation came from a desire among the white police and HUD to keep an eye on us. He pointed out the fact that the Indian trailer court, courts, quoting him here, are floodlit at night. One of these sites was a National Guard base known as Camp Rapid, where a year after the flood, 15 Native families were still living. Lone Hill reported to Congress under oath on several incidents that he saw firsthand of what he called gross discrimination at Camp Rapid. One such incident involved National Guardsmen shooting blanks and conducting very loud training exercises right near the section of the camp that was set aside for Indian flood victims. I mean, these are people that just went through a natural disaster, and now they have people basically firing guns in their backyard just a couple weeks after the disaster itself. The guardsmen harassed us continually, Lone Hill said at the hearings. They would scare all the kids and the old people. They could have been practicing in other areas of the camp far removed from where we were housed at the time, but they did not. On another occasion, Lone Hill recalled that he and his wife were sleeping, and they heard an explosion at Camp Rapid. They went and investigated. They found that a uh, hot water heater had burst in the men's bathroom. So they called the National Guard officer who was on duty at the time, who, according to Lone Hill's testimony, arrived on the scene drunk and belligerent. Quoting Lone Hill here, he said, you damned Indians have raised enough cane around here. We're going to evict you in the morning, and all you damned Indians will be out here with your baggage. 
So Lone Hill's experience, as reported to Congress in 1973, exemplified some of the inequalities that were kind of baked into the flood relief efforts. HUD, the government agency in charge of relief, supplied hundreds of disaster relief trailers designed for temporary use. A year after the disaster, though, 31%, 31% of those living in disaster housing were people of color, the majority of which, according to the Flood's congressional report, the majority of which are Indian. HUD trailers were also rented to flood victims at $45 per month, with utilities, electricity, water, running an additional $40 per month. Lone Hill reported to Congress, quote, that that is too much for anyone that has to live on Social Security. It's too much for most of our people. Other housing inequalities came with the Small Business Administration, or SBA loans, which were given to businesses and to homeowners as part of this larger federal disaster relief package. By the time the September 30th, 1972 deadline for loan applications came around, 88.5, excuse me, $85.1 million in home and business loans had been approved. Most people got around $10,000 in relief money through these loans if they lost housing or a business in the flood. According to the SBA's own data, that organization distributed $1.3 million of that $85 million to native people in Rapid City. That's about 1.5% of the total out of, remember those numbers from the start of my talk, right? A total native flood victim population of between 15 and 20%. Again, put those numbers side by side, 1.5% compared to 15 to 20%. And that number, 15 to 20%, being only the percentage of those who died in the flood, not the percentages of those who lost property or lost housing or were displaced, which is likely, far higher, and to my knowledge, was not a number that people kept track of. Moreover, moreover, the relief efforts prioritized rapid cityans who owned homes and who owned businesses, who were mostly white, rather than the city's more mobile, less economically secure native population, most of whom rented. Even if Rapid City's native victims were able to acquire relief funds, they often found it more difficult to use them. Hazel Bonner, remember, in charge, she was in charge of that organization that helped to uh, uh, advocate for renters in Rapid City. She testified to Congress, quoting her here, that there is discrimination in Rapid City against minority groups, particularly Indians, in the months after the flood. And she explained, Bonner explained, that Rapid City after the flood had a very crunched, a very small housing market, with rent prices skyrocketing in the wake of the flood, as displaced people moved out of HUD trailers and into private, newly found residences. Bonner described an experiment that her organization ran, where, quoting her here, we sent a white tenant and an Indian tenant out to get a list of private rentals within 10 minutes of each other. The white tenant got three possible places to live, while the Indian tenant got nothing. So, between this very expensive HUD housing, the inability for many Native people to apply for this SBA loan at all, the rampant housing discrimination on the private market, Lone Hill said to Congress that we found very often our people get discouraged and simply leave town after the flood. So that's the immediate aftermath. But in the months and the years that followed 1972, Rapid City undertook a project of intensive urban reinvention. Opinions on how to rebuild after the flood were divided in the city. In the late summer of 1972, Rapid City's local government commissioned a report that was designed to be a comprehensive analysis of all of the communities in Rapid City who have been affected by this disaster. This report's findings described a native community that was in dire need of assistance within a city that was ready and primed to completely reinvent itself, basically marking this as a moment of opportunity for Rapid City. The flood provided Rapid City with an opportunity, in short. Prior to the disaster, according to this report, the homes along the creek were said to be inferior shacks, the report said, which were often rented out by absentee owners at very high rental rates. With all of those units destroyed, and with dozens of families now homeless, and with relief money pouring in to the city, the report said that the city government had an opportunity to build new housing, fairly priced housing, that was better integrated within the city's geography, that wasn't segregated in just a couple parts of the city. Attention should be given, the report said, to locating these units throughout the city, and that affordability should be a paramount concern. The higher cost of living should not be a hardship on poorer families. Yet studies like this were at best only partially heated. 
Within months of the disaster, local leaders had agreed on a $300 million aid package and reconstruction plan for Rapid City and the Eastern Black Hills. Local urban planners also designed a new centerpiece for the city's future, which if you've ever been to Rapid City, you probably have seen firsthand. A green belt that would run along Rapid Creek's floodplain that was meant for both recreational space and was designed to prevent any future construction in Rapid Creek's floodplain and within this kind of dangerous path of Rapid Creek. By 1975, this project was well underway. 1,400 parcels of land were bought by the city to be converted into parkland. This project was overseen by the first native mayor of Rapid City, the four-term mayor, Arthur LaCroix. Among the other construction projects that were built with aid money was a flood memorial, a federal office building, an arts center, a post office, a high-rise office building, and a civic center. But the Greenway was the centerpiece. And it remains today a central part of Rapid City's urban environment, kind of this physical embodiment of this idea of never again. Some of those parcels that were turned into parkland had once been Oshkosh Camp. The flood destroyed all of the transient housing along Rapid Creek, which of course had been a goal that was sought by whites in Rapid City for a very long time. As the Rapid City Journal put it bluntly, 10 years after the flood in a flood retrospective article, quote, the flood of 1972 completed the removal of the low income neighborhood along the creek. I think that's an interesting way to put it, right? Completed the removal. This was a plan. This was something that Rapid City had wanted to do for a long time. The amount of housing built with flood aid money is pretty hard to pin down. There is definitely evidence that some housing specifically for low income Rapid City residents was constructed. Some of the flood relief money did verifiably go toward housing some of the most vulnerable people in Rapid City. Sheridan Heights, for instance, a housing development on the city's western side was one such neighborhood, which through funding from HUD acquired land and refurbished flood damaged homes for low income residents of Rapid City. By the mid-1970s, this one neighborhood, Sheridan Heights, contained 48 homes, including 18 that belonged to native families. But those 48 homes were not enough. And even if the city did build a little bit more housing than that, they did not build enough with the money that was, uh, with the money that they received. Not enough to correct the housing crisis, which had been a lingering problem even before the flood had destroyed so much of the city's housing stock. The Pennington County Housing and Redevelopment Commission before the flood estimated that 300 new low-income homes were needed to house the city's poorer residents. And again, that was before the flood destroyed so many people's homes. So because of the displacement of those living along the floodplain, other existing native neighborhoods quickly became overcrowded. In the Lakota Homes, which was part of a federal housing neighborhood in North Rapid that was built in the 1960s, the waiting list for housing grew from 28 families to over 70 families in just one year after the Rapid City flood. So as I begin to wrap up here, I've already gone long. I talk too much, I know. What are we to make of the legacy of the flood in Rapid City? In some ways, in some ways, this is a story, I'm gonna leave it here for now actually. In some ways it's the story of the most vulnerable population, excuse me, in some ways, this is a story of Rapid City's leaders failing the most vulnerable population of Rapid City in the wake of a disaster. Concepts like the Greenway, while admirable and even worth emulating elsewhere, were not conceived of with environmental justice in mind. With so much money going towards civic improvements, not enough housing was built to solve the housing crisis, which really still plagues Rapid City to this day. It's a city that today has a homelessness rate that's triple the national average. But that's not the only legacy Either. That's one legacy, that's one takeaway. Remember, this is a, a talk about meaning, right? What meanings do we draw from history? I think that's one important meaning that we have to look at in the face if we're gonna really remember this disaster for what it was. But that's not the only legacy. That's not the only meaning. The post-flood story is also a story, I would argue, of, to an extent, visionary redevelopment, right? While pretty imperfect in its execution, I think creating park space along a known floodplain ensuring that people would never again live in danger should Rapid Creek rise again, I think is a good 
idea, right? I think is indeed something that's worth emulating in other cities. Moreover, the heroism and the generosity shown by so many people, white and native alike, in Rapid City during the flood and the days that followed, cannot and indeed should not be ignored. People are capable of extraordinary things when their neighbors are in danger. And the 1972 flood revealed a true sense of community in Rapid City. The flood also fostered a spirit of activism in West River, South Dakota, specifically in and around the Black Hills. The American Indian Movement cited the flood and the inequalities that were woven throughout its recovery as one of the reasons why they chose Rapid City as one of the hubs that they were, or excuse me, one of their hubs of protest throughout the 1970s, culminating in the late 1970s in their teaming, teaming up with white ranchers and environmental activists as a group calling itself the Black Hills Alliance, which from the late 1970s through the early 1980s successfully stopped additional uranium mining in the Black Hills. And that indigenous-led legacy, spirit of activism continues to this day in Rapid City with groups like the NDN Collective fighting for native rights and sovereignty and land. So to close, I hope that my presentation's um, message has been clear, right? That history is a complicated thing, that we should reject simple stories in history, that even tragedies like the 1972 Rapid City Flood are complicated events. I think it's possible, even necessary, to embrace that complication, to recognize the good alongside the mistakes, the resilience alongside the errors. The flood revealed some of the best and some of the worst of Rapid City. June 9th, 1972 was an evening and a night of countless examples of individual heroism. It also was an example of deep-seated environmental injustice. The recovery showed the kind of forward-thinking city planning that is really necessary as we confront our changing climate. It also demonstrated a short-sightedness and a refusal to commit to radical change, which is still having ripple effects, still having impacts on Rapid City today. Both can be true at the same time. And indeed, that both good and the bad, the success and the failure, they can lie side by side next to one another. I think that's really at the heart of history's power. Only by being truthful about what happened in Rapid City's past can we create a better future for all of those who today live along Mini Luzahan. Thank you all very much, and I look forward to your questions and your comments and your feedback. <laughs> who has a question for me? I'm sorry, hi. That's a good question. You know, I don't live in Rapid City. I'm not from Rapid City. I'm an outsider to this story in a lot of different ways. So I would hesitate to give too strong of an impression. That said, I'll, 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 just, I'll, say, I'll talk a little bit. So one of the themes of this talk was complication, right? That, you know, legacies of things are complicated. And I think that Rapid City is still a city today that is often defined by a lot of the same elements of segregation and racism of the type that I was talking about before the flood as well. But I don't think that's the whole story either, right? I think that a lot of the kind of activism that you see, the continued activism uh, trying to forestall uranium mining and gold mining in the Black Hills is often conducted by people of all races and backgrounds from Rapid City coming together to protect the hills, right? So I know that's kind of a, a, kind of a both answer, but I think that a lot of the problems have not been solved. Right? Most of the homeless population in Rapid are native. Right? That's a problem that has its legacies in a lot of the history that I just told. But that's not the whole story either. Right? And I think that there is still the sense of community in Rapid, too. Does that answer your question? OK. Yes. Well, what was your name? I should have asked you earlier. What's your name? Siobhan. Siobhan? Let's hear it. Say that again. I'm sorry, I missed it. Did you choose to do the presentation on like the flood in Rapid City and all of this um, because you were coming to Black Hills? I've actually been working on this project since 2016. Really? I've been working on it for a really long time. Yeah, I'm actually writing a book on this same topic as we speak. So, 
Um, no, the, uh, the memorial reached out to me to give this talk here because the 50th anniversary just happened. So um, no, it's kind of the other way, where I'm, I am talking here because I've been working on this project for so long. Ooh, a lot of questions now. Let's go in the back. My St. Paul friend, let's hear it. Mm. What do you mean by dealt with? Can you define what you're talking about a little bit? Like, was there like any like, like protests or any reaction to that at all? Or oh, that's a really good question. I haven't found any examples of that. That does not mean that it didn't happen. Indeed, I would say that it probably did happen, but on a smaller scale. So. I think one of the reasons why the American Indian Movement chooses Rapid City as one of the, the sites that it is going to hold a lot of its most kind of spectacular protests in is because it's a city that is ready to kind of boil over with a lot of the anger for this long history that, uh, of, of, of segregation and racism that had been you know, one of the threads through the city's history, right? So I, that's a long way of saying, I'm not sure, my guess is probably on a small scale, and the reason why AIM chooses Rapid City is because it was time for a larger protest to push back against this history in this place. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. But it's something I should try to find more about. Um, but I haven't found that much evidence of that to this point. There were a bunch of hands. Where to go next? I already asked you. We'll come back to you. Yeah, let's hear it. Uh, what will the book be I, I am so bad at titles of books and articles and everything that I write. I've been working on that for a very long time. If you have a good idea for a title, I would love to hear it. So I originally had a title in mind. I kind of wanted to call it White Water because it's about race and it's about a flood and stuff. But I had some friends who said, ah, oh, don't call it. That's not a very good title. So that's not going to be the title. But that was one idea that I had. So if anyone has ideas for a good title for this book, um, please lay them on me. I'd like to hear it. Um, there was oh, way in the back. Hi. Uh, what do you think this would mean to populate? That's a really, that's another good question. It's the kind of question that I wish I had a better answer for. So um, I lived in Denver for a couple years, and as cliche as it is, I really fell in love with the American West when I was living in Denver, and I knew I wanted to do some kind of project for my PhD that was on the American West, and I care about environmental justice, and I care about examples of environmental racism like this. And as I was doing my research, casting about for some kind of project about the American West, I stumbled across the story of this flood. And I was blown away that I had never heard this story before. 238 people dead, at least, in, you know, for the Northern Plains, a pretty major city. A disproportionate number of them, native people. I had never heard of this story before, and the more I learned about it, the more that I felt like it was, that I didn't want people like me who hadn't heard of this before. I wanted more people to know this story. So, I mean, like I was kind of saying a second ago, I'm an outsider to this place in a lot of different ways. I had never been to Rapid City before I started this project. Now I've been several times, and I know people here and everything, but it was something that I couldn't believe I hadn't heard of before, and I wanted to make sure that that experience was not replicated elsewhere. There was a question up here-ish. Yes, you seem skeptical of asking a question. Let's hear it. Um, I was just going to ask if the Rapid City Indian School was still standing, or did it get ruined in the flood? No, it was not ruined in the flood. I don't think it was affected by the flood at all, but it's still there. It's now still the Sioux San Hospital, as it's called, the Sioux Sanatorium Hospital. And it's an Indian Health Service hospital in Rapid City. It's still there today. Who else? OK, we can come back to you now. Okay. Okay. Yes. As a complete outsider, just to come to this on, well, welcome. <laughs> what would you say the effect of tourism is on either bringing attention to this disparity mm. or just considering tourists like me that come through and don't learn of this? I think, honestly, the Crazy Horse Memorial here is doing a great job at that. And so when I teach my history classes, my classes are mostly white students who don't know a lot about Native history. I mean, in Minnesota, a lot of them think that Native history ended in like, you know, either 1492 or in 1862 or in like 1890, right? Which is frustrating, of course, but I try to teach them that, no, Native history is an ongoing history just like all history. Right, And I think that tourism can do that same job for me. Right, And I think that the Crazy Horse Memorial is doing a really good job at that, showing that this is an ongoing, a very deep, a very rich history. That if you can educate people in places like 
this museum and this memorial, then you can do, a, you know, education, education changes the way that people see the world. And tourism, I think, has a really important role to play in that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. Anything else? Yes. Yeah, that's a really good question. It's a complicated story, right? I was actually, I was in Rapid City today and I was talking with, uh, the, the, with uh, uh, Troy Kilpatrick who runs the Journey Museum. And we were talking about that same question, right? That it can't just be a story of one thing, right? That the fact that Art LaCroix was elected four times says that there was a willingness for people in Rapid City to be led by a native politician, right? So I think both those things can exist at the, can exist at the same time. You can have a lot of racism in a city and you can also be led by a native person. That things like racism are complicated and illogical. Right, that you can't necessarily put them in a neat box. So I think you're absolutely right about that, and I think that speaks to this idea of complication that is really at the center of my work, and I think of all history. Anything else? What surprised you the most? What surprised me the most? Hmm. I don't know, I'm kind of pausing here to think. I'm vamping for time a little bit. Um, what surprised me, I mean, honestly, all right, this will be kind of a cop-out answer, but just that this flood happened at all, I mean, like I said, when I started this project, I did not know, I see some people laughing at my answer. I think it's a good answer, thank you very much. Um, I, had, I did not know that this was a thing that happened, right? To have the, I think it's the third largest flash flood in American history in terms of people, in terms of, of the death toll, to have that be something that can basically slip under a lot of people's radar is a shock, right? So just the knowledge that this tragedy happened and that I could live the first, I don't know, 27, 28 years of my life without ever having heard of it, I think that was the most surprising thing to me. You know, I also, honestly, I really loved learning about, and I want to try to learn more about how Oshkosh was a community, right? So much of the writing from the time about Oshkosh camp really just called it like a dirty slum where, what's that one line, where scores of Indians dwell that needs to be taken out of Rapid City, right? And, you know, people live there out of necessity. I'm not trying to build it up to be something that it wasn't. There was no running water. These houses were not heated. It was, in many ways, a, a very, a, 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 not an easy place to live, right? But learning about how it was also a community, how people coming to Rapid City from very far afield could find community there, that was something that I really enjoyed learning about as well. And that's something I'm on the hunt to find out more about as I continue this project. Yes? Okay, um, I'm sorry, I keep asking questions. Don't apologize for asking questions. Um, what was your reaction to learning about how like, the, the community was there? It, <laughs> I mean, it, it inspired me, right? That, like, that people can come together under conditions like this to take people in. And, you know, and kind of to your question earlier as well, the fact that in, another thing that kind of impressed me, that impressed that upon me was how people, white and native in Rapid City, came together to rebuild after the flood, to save people during the flood itself. That I meant it when I said it. There's a real sense of community in Rapid City, both in Oshkosh as well, certainly, but within the wider community too. That was the thing that, that made me happy to answer your question basically. It, it gave me some sense of inspiration that even in pretty impoverished conditions in a place like Oshkosh, that people can still come together and build a neighborhood. These are all good questions. Yes, Travis? Are there um, good numbers about how, you know, it wasn't just the Rapid City flood, it was the Black Hills flood. So yeah. Were you able to find many numbers um, on race impact from other communities? And oh, man. Federal funding did reach other communities, but as far as numbers go, I have not found them. That doesn't mean they don't exist, right? This is an ongoing project and I'm just one guy working on it, but that's something for me to look more into. I know that, yeah, other communities did get funding. Um, this is just me talking off the top of my head, so I'm forgetting stuff, but I know that one Black Hills town was basically entirely wiped out by the flood, and they got a lot of money to rebuild. It was one of the tourist towns. Keystone. Keystone, yes, thank you so much. Keystone was almost entirely wiped out by the flood, and they got a lot of money to rebuild. And a lot of campers died in Keystone as well. Some uh, uh, washed away in their sleeping bags that night who were staying there. 
Um, but as to your question about numbers and how it breaks down demographically, that I'm not sure about. Anything else? This is the most fun part for me. Yes? The death toll in Keystone, I believe, was 13. Oh, wow. And the largest was a family, mother, and three children. Yeah. Caught in a campground. Yeah. There's so many examples in this story of, you know, it, it's, it's a sad story, right? Of whole families dying alongside one another, just like that family you're talking about. Are you from Keystone? No. Oh, okay. You just, you just know. Gotcha. Okay. Anything else? Crowd regular. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Last call for questions? Yes. Number four. Mm -hmm. So when the first time you visited, you went to Rapid City, what did you think? What do you mean, what did I think? Like, I, I love the city. Um, I, I had a friend there who kind of showed me around. I think it's a beautiful city. Um, what, do you, what do you mean though by what did I think? I was surprised that like, that like something of like such destruction happened at a place that doesn't look like Yeah, that. that's actually a really good way of framing it. I mean, Honestly, my first impression of the Greenway was what a good idea this is, right? Of this belt of parkland running alongside Rapid Creek to make sure that people wouldn't live there again. My first impression was this is a great idea. Why aren't other cities doing things like this? As I learned more about the Greenway, I learned that it's got a complicated history, right? That there's kind of structural issues with how housing was developed in the wake of it. But that was one of my first impressions was Rapid City can be a model for other places. And you know, I'm, I love going back to Rapid City anytime I can. It's, it's, a, it's a place I'm glad is now a part of my life because I've been working on this project. Anything else? Yes, in the back. You may not be the person to ask. Okay. Is there a memorial for those who died in the flood? There is a flood memorial, yes, there is, in Rapid City. It was one of the things that was built with the flood money. It's a, it's a beautiful outdoor memorial that's right along the creek. So if you're in Rapid, I suggest checking it out. It's, it's a nice place. All right, well, we're already, oh yeah, no, I'll answer questions all night, I meant what I said. Uh, so, has there been like another flood that affected anything else, or was the dam rebuilt, constructed dam? The dam was rebuilt, was reconstructed, um, it's still there, the dam has not burst. I mean, the floods that Rapid Creek has had since then, and I don't have numbers off the top of my head, but they have had less of an impact because of the Greenway, right? That if it floods, it now floods into like golf courses and parkland, and so they're not gonna have the same effect. Which again, kind of to your question, is one of the things that I think Rapid City did really well here, is making sure that that's what would happen when the creek, I mean, creeks are gonna flood. We can't help that from happening. There's gonna be big rainstorms in the Black Hills. That rain is gonna wash down the hills into things like, into creeks like Rapid Creek. But if we can keep people out of the floodplain, that's what really matters. So there have been, but they haven't been nearly as destructive. To that point of what you were saying in regard to the 10-year floods, mm -hmm. there's an effect within waterways with streams of 10-year floods and even what they call 100-year floods, where within like the farm record and how often those kinds of things can be predicted. Um, Places like northeastern Colorado, the South Platte River has experienced mm -hmm. hundred year floods that have a lot of people have lost their lives up into the high country where the continental divide, where the water splits out to the country. Mm -hmm. So when water comes down, and if you get 13 inches of rain in a matter of a day, you have major flooding that happens all the way out into the plains. Mm -hmm. Sometimes those kind of hundred year floods and things can be predicted in that way. But uh, to Dr. Hosman's point, the, the fact that waterways and spillways to, in modern day construction can help to alleviate a lot of that. Yeah. I think the highway coming in and out of Rapid has been designed, you, you notice how it's mm -hmm. strange, it slopes over. Yeah, 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 is that? Every so often it's got a lot of uh, drainage vents. Oh, I grew gotcha. up on the other side of the city, so I'm not <laughs> Your East River, I see, yeah, gotcha. Uh, Okay. The highway had been strategically designed to squeeze gotcha. the water if it does get going that fast again. Okay, another thing for me to, to look into. I did not know that. But I have noticed that it's kind of weirdly shaped like yeah, that. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. I, I've never, I haven't seen anything like that in yeah. any, any other preserve. Yeah. Anything else? Was that a hand? As soon as I looked at you, it went down. Okay, I won't force you. Yeah, go for it. You still got two more to go to catch up to her, but two is good. Oh, 
According to the government records that I've been using for that, yes. Because that money was doled out, the way to get that money was if you were a primarily a homeowner or a business owner who lost uh, your property in that flood. Most of the native people in Rapid at the time were business owners and were renters, right? So it was just kind of the way that, was, that this was designed, right? Was that this money was to go to people that lost homes, right? But a home is not just a house that you own. A home is also a place that you could rent, right? So when I talk about structural problems, that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about, right? That people that were designing this relief program just weren't designing it with poorer residents, with native residents necessarily in Rapid City in mind. Now, not all native people in Rapid City rented, right? You have a lot of native people who are homeowners as well who were able to take advantage of this. But the majority of people who lost their homes who were native in Rapid rented, thus were unable to get that money. Anything else? All right, Andrew's giving me the look, so we can call it there. Thank, thank you. you all so much. Thank you all for coming, and thank you to the students especially for coming. It was a pleasure getting through this presentation to you, and thank you so much for your questions. Good luck in the rest of this program. Thank you.